Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about how we can use factor models to estimate expected returns. Okay, the first factor model that you may want to be using, I mean the simplest of them all, is the capital asset pricing model, the CAPM. And if the CAPM is the true asset pricing model, then we have a very simple prescription in the sense that we know that excess expected return for a given stock is proportional to the beta of the stock as can be seen from this equation. Now, this equation has a very simple implication when you think about it. It says that mu i, expected return on the stock minus RF, the risk-free rate divided by beta i, the beta of the stock. So that ratio, excess expected return divided by beta, which is known as the trainer ratio. Well, the CAPM predicts that the trainer ratio is going to be exactly the same for all stocks and the quantity that you're going to get in terms of that trainer ratio will be the market risk premium mu m minus rf and that quantity will be the same across stocks. Now if that were true, if we were to live in a world where the cap m was the true uh, model, then the true asset pricing model, then this would have very profound and simple implications for portfolio construction. Well, to see this, just take a look at the Sharpe ratio of the portfolio. What you need to be able to estimate critically is mu i minus rf shows up at the numerator of the Sharpe uh, ratio for the portfolio. Well, mu i minus rf, according to the cap m, is nothing but beta i times mu, mu m minus rf. And the mu m minus rf being the same for all stocks factors out. So in the end, maximizing the Sharpe ratio is just equivalent to maximizing the ratio given by the weighted average of the betas of individual stocks, sum of wi beta i, which is nothing but the beta of the portfolio, divided by portfolio volatility. So that's a very simple prescription and, you know, using a good estimate for the covariance matrix and good estimate for the betas, then you have everything you need to optimize the portfolio. Well, the problem though, as we know, is that we do not live necessarily in the multi-factor world as we will see in a single factor world as we will see. And therefore, we will need to revisit this assumption of the cap M being the true asset pricing model. Now, before we do so, just let's take a look at the kind of estimates you get. So in this uh, context, we are using the uh, 30 industry portfolio from the Ken French library data library, which is available on his website. So you get 30 sector indices. And we are looking at five years worth of monthly data from 2013 to 2018. And this table actually contains two types of estimate for expected return. The first column is precisely given by the cap and based estimate for these, um, uh, for these expected returns using an estimate for beta based on the sample of data and also an estimate for the risk-free rate and the market risk premium on the, same, on the same sample. The same way, we are shifting to the uh, column number two. We are looking at a, a competing estimate for um, expected return, which is given by the historical mean. Simply looking at the sample value, sample mean value over this five-year period of time. Now, clearly, as we can see, the cap and based uh, expected return estimates are much more reasonable. Much, much more reasonable. In particular, the range of those estimates is much uh, smaller compared to the range of estimates that you get with the sample mean. With the sample mean, you get a uh, negative, I mean, the worst or, or the lowest value that you get is minus 14.88% which just does not make any sense in terms of an expected return estimate. Well, minus 14.88 is just happens to be the realized return on that particular sector index that did particularly poorly over the sample period. But of course, that does not imply that minus 15% would be a, a reasonable estimate for, you know, uh, that sector index expected return looking forward. In contrast, if you look at what happens with respect to cap and based estimate, the range is much smaller. The minimum is around 5.76. So we're looking at things that are much more reasonable numbers. 
those more re re reasonable expected return estimates translate into more reasonable portfolios. So if you start to maximize sharp ratios based on either CAPM based expected returns or historical mean expected returns estimates for the same covariance matrix, which is you know, the sample based covariance matrix, then you find portfolio weights that are very different. And in particular, the historical weights which show up in orange on this graph show a much broader variation. Some of those weights are as, you know, as low as minus 50% or even worse than minus 50%, and the most you know, positive ones are above 50%. We are clearly looking at an extreme, not well balanced, not very reasonable portfolio. Now, if you look at CAPM based estimates, because they are more reasonable, they give you a portfolio which is you know, much better behaved, you still see a number of short uh, positions that eventually we may want to deal with, but that's going to come later on. Now, moving on from the CAPM single factor model, given that we know that the world is better explained in terms of multi factor exposures, then we might be tempted to use you know, Steve Ross arbitrage pricing theory, which is some kind of um, you know, arbitrage pricing model, asset pricing model that gives us a, a, a particular uh, expression for what the expected return should be. That expression is actually generalizes the CAPM equation to the multi-factor setting. And this equation tells us that the excess expected return on a given stock is given by the sum of the product of the factor exposures of that stock with respect to all rewarded factors times the reward on those factors, the excess return on those factors, as can be seen from this equation. Now, the problem though, if you want to be using that equation in the context of optimizing the Sharpe ratio, the problem is you need to be able to estimate the excess return or the Sharpe ratios, lambda k, of those factors which wasn't really the case when you had a single factor because that excess return on the market, you didn't even need to know what it was. It factored out and we didn't uh, need to estimate it for optimizing the, 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 the sharp ratio of the portfolio. When you're moving on to multi-factors, yes, then you need to estimate those uh, excess return or risk premium on factors and that's not good news because estimating expected return on factors is as difficult as estimating expected returns on individual components of the portfolio, if you will. So we're kind of back to square one. So, so what do we do in terms of estimating these expected returns? Well, there are different options. Option number one, which is an agnostic approach. If you don't know how to distinguish between these factors in terms of expected returns, you may want to assume that these expected returns are all equal for these factors. Well, that may not be necessarily the most reasonable choice given that some factors are riskier than others. So the agnostic prior will actually tell you that you should assume that all of these factors have the same sharp ratio, the same reward per unit of risk. So that's, you know, you kind of giving up in trying to distinguish factors in terms of which one has the highest reward per unit of risk. You're saying, well, the data is not very informative, so I'm going to assume they're all equal. Well, the alternative would be to take a look at the data precisely, but take a look at not a small sample, but the, the, the lo long sample, the longest possible sample. And then you may want to look at the sharp ratio for all of these factors over the longest possible sample. And by looking at this, you may come to the conclusion that some of these, you know, factors have a higher uh, reward compared to other factors per unit of risk. And you may want to use that information or that piece of information to kind of optimize your portfolio. Well, then there's a last approach, let's call that the active approach, whereby we recognize that it might actually precisely be the value of an active portfolio manager to be able to express meaningful forward-looking views about the sharp ratios of these factors. And in which case, then, we are going to be using the active views generating by the managers based on some qualitative analysis or perhaps quantitative analysis. Well, that's precisely the skill of active portfolio management to be able to make those calls in terms of forward-looking estimates for active returns. Well, wrapping up, factor models can be used to 
obtain meaningful estimates for expected returns on securities. The bad news, though, is when there's more than one factor in your factor model, you then need to have to rely on meaningful estimate of expected return on factors. And well, if you have at your disposal uh, active managers, well, you may kind of want to turn to them and, and ask them you know, to generate active use for these, uh, for these factors. Alternatively, you may want to be using some agnostic prior, assuming that all factors have the same reward per unit of risk, or do something based on, on you know, simple historical data.